But to set the stage, the church is in serious debt. They've, they've got major, major financial pr problems at this point. Having uh, dedicated the Kirtland Temple, having the saints in Missouri driven out and losing a lot of property that they're still trying to figure out what to do with that, and now having the saints being removed from Clay County, Missouri as well, they're just in a lot of financial difficulty right now. And in July of 1836, a man by the name of William Burgess uh, comes into Kirtland to speak with Joseph and some of the leadership, and, and he tells them, hey, I know of a house in Salem, Massachusetts, where in the cell, in the basement is buried a treasure. There, there's gold and silver there. And so Joseph and Hiram and Oliver and Sidney, in early August, they leave Kirtland and they go east. They, they visit New York City, they go up to Boston, and then they end up in Salem where they meet up with this William Burgess. And they, they walk different places. William thinks he remembers where the house is with the buried treasure. Um, they spend about four days there. The record is, is not complete, but obviously they're looking for this treasure and they can't find it. And at that point, Joseph turns to the Lord to ask what they should do, and we receive section 111. Look at how the Lord opens up this section. Um, by the way, has there ever been a time in your life when in a desperate situation, when you're in what we might call fight-or-flight mode, you, you make a very, very rash or quick um, reaction to something, only to later on realize, oh, that probably wasn't the best thing to do or probably not the wisest thing to say when I was in that, that fight-or-flight, that, that anxious mode of, oh no, what am I going to do? I'm in trouble and I need, I need something to fix my problem. Well, look at how the Lord begins this revelation. Verse 1, I, the Lord your God, am not displeased with you coming this journey, notwithstanding your follies. In other words, had Joseph asked the Lord before going, the Lord could have given him some specific directions, and maybe, just maybe, the Lord might have sent him on this journey anyway, but it would have been for a different purpose. Now, before we proceed in Salem, Massachusetts with this, this group of four men who went back to find this treasure, let's just bring this story home to us today and say, hmm, what could I do to avoid folly, to avoid doing things that would maybe not work out the way I thought they would, they should work out? Some of you have heard of the, the uh, acronym HALT, that you don't make major life decisions in a period of HALT, which is when you're overly hungry, when you're angry, when you're overly lonely, or when you're extremely tired. HALT, H-A-L-T. Why? Because sometimes it becomes this, this reaction, or, and there are a million other words you could add in here, when you're, when you're in an emotional state that isn't calm, where you're, you can think clearly, fight or flight mode is great for saving your life in an emergency, but not great for making life decisions that, that could affect your entire future. And so when you're in a relationship or when you're struggling in a crisis of faith or when you're trying to make major life decisions regarding education or career, it's probably best to not make decisions when you're in a trough of life, when you're in a valley of the shadow of death. It's probably best to hold on at that point and try 
to, to endure until you can see more clearly, where you can think more clearly, then make those decisions that have these lasting effects. Knowing there are going to be times when we're feeling all of these, these other emotions, but at that point we hold on to the iron rod when we're in the mists of darkness. We're not making major decisions, major life decisions, or going directions that will have effect on us. Now, back to Salem. When they realize that, well, this trip isn't going to uh, give us any major treasure of gold and silver, look at what the Lord tells them. Look at verse uh, 2. I have much treasure in this city for you, for the benefit of Zion, and many people in this city whom I will gather out in due time for the benefit of Zion through your instrumentality. You'll notice God didn't say, thank you for coming looking for buried treasure, but instead, you four, I'm going to give you all these people to join the church. Nobody joins the church in August of 1836 when Joseph is there that I know of. But later on, in 1841, William Law and Hiram Smith give a mission call with a copy of section 111 to Benjamin Winchester and Erastus Snow and say, would you go and fulfill the prophecies in section 111? So they go. Benjamin Winchester doesn't last very long. Uh, he, he forsakes the mission very shortly after they've arrived and leaves, but Erastus Snow stays there in Salem, and he carries this revelation on a piece of paper in his pocket, and he reads it frequently, and it is very hard for him at first. He's, he has, he's facing a lot of opposition, and it's that revelation that keeps him there. And can you imagine for Erastus Snow what the words in verse 2 would mean? Or look at verse 4, it shall come to pass in due time that I will give this city into your hands. You see, sometimes you and I, we get promises or we get impressions and, and inspiration from the Lord, and we think, oh, okay, well, the Lord's going to help me fix all my problems right now. And then when those problems don't get fixed right now, we can get frustrated and give up trying to seek to, to receive those those promises and have them be fulfilled. I love the story of Erastus Snow here, where he perseveres, he en endures some struggles and some setbacks and some opposition because he knows that in due time good things are going to happen in this city. And it's interesting that it, it was actually accelerated by some people who were fighting against him and his message, who challenged him to a public debate. And they show up in this public forum and have this public debate, and Erastus Snow does so well that many people are convinced, and now he starts teaching a whole bunch of people. By the time he's finished, he's going to, to have baptized over a hundred people in Salem, Massachusetts. One guy and it's because section 111 was given. Now, it's fascinating to me to consider this in its historical setting that if you're Joseph Smith or Hiram Smith or Oliver or Sidney, the four brethren who went to Salem looking for treasure, you could feel really silly, you could feel ashamed of, of your folly, but isn't it fascinating how God has the capacity as an infinite and an all-powerful, almighty being to take our perceived folly, our, our perceived struggles and, and mess-ups even at times, and if we keep working with him and trusting him, he can turn those struggles into miraculous successes in ways that we never would have foreseen. Um, section 111 to me is a reminder that in spite of my weakness, in spite of my, my reactionary fight-or-flight reflexes that are quite silly at times, 
it's okay. God is still able to do his work and still able to perform miracles in due time. Now, for some of you, that phrase in due time equates to a couple of weeks for resolution to come, or maybe a couple of days. For others, it's a couple of years. For others, it's maybe a couple of decades. And for some of you, it's not until the next life. But in due time, if we trust God and we keep turning heavenward, in due time, his miracles, his purposes will be fulfilled, and our folly won't, won't get in the way of God doing his work.